Hi everyone and welcome to a new episode of Tales of Tourism, a podcast created by tourism students and professionals for you. My name is Amber and I'm sitting here with Joost. Hey Amber. Hi Joost. Uh, you already know him from previous episodes and today we are going to do something a little bit different. We are going to talk about a topic that is related to tourism and for today we chose the topic transportation. Uh, so Joost, maybe as a first question, I am wondering which form of transport do you often use when you travel? And then I don't mean work-related travel because we will probably talk about that in a later episode. But when you go on a holiday or when you are on a holiday. Ah, thank you, Amber. Yeah, that differs quite a lot, actually. Uh, within Europe, most of the time I try to travel either by bus or by train. Um, although that's not always possible or it's rather difficult sometimes. Um, for example, my, my girlfriend, uh, she's from Lithuania. She's called Neringa Kavalio Skaite. Um, that's a very good name like that you can cool. try to pronounce when you're drunk. Like, it's <laughs> almost impossible. <laughs> <laughs> you could just try it. Anyway, um, when we travel to Lithuania, because of course we travel quite often to her family, um, yeah, then we always have to make considerations because there are no... Well, it is connected by train, um, but that really takes a long time, like more than 40 hours to get there. Uh, and there's... Well, Flixbus doesn't go there, uh, and other bus systems are also not that well connected. So our main options, our main easy options to go there are either by car or by plane. Um, yeah, as an environmental sciences alumnus, because I studied both environmental sciences and tourism. Fancy. Uh, if it fancy, <laughs> fancy, I know. <laughs> I have the tendency to check the environmental impact of my actions, so also of traveling. So once I actually did this uh, big analysis on, okay, what is better, going by car or going by plane to Lithuania? And actually it was rather surprising for me, because... Um, if you go alone by car, you have bigger CO2 emissions than when you go uh, alone by plane. Yeah, that was quite a big shock because I never really considered how many people uh, you travel with, like your travel partner. So if you're with three or four people or even two people, it's better to travel by car. But if you're just alone in a car, it already makes a big difference in, in terms of environmental impact. Um, Actually, it's very nice because nowadays there are also online tools that you can use to check your environmental impact when you, you travel for your transport. Um, one international one that you can use in Europe is travelandclimate.org. Uh, That's the website how it's called. Yeah, and actually I really like that website because you can literally say, okay, I travel from, for example, the Netherlands, so from Wageningen to Kaunas in Lithuania. Um, I travel with two people. Um, I'm going by either a car or plane or I just want a comparison and you can even put like what kind of car you're traveling with like a small car, a petrol car uh, or a diesel car or whatever um, or you go by a charter flight or um, a business class or you go by train and it even saves um, sorry, it even has a database um, in which it checks in which country the train which countries the train crosses. So it sees what kind of electricity is using. So ele electricity generated by nuclear power, electricity generated by uh, wind energy or, or energy from uh, coal-fired power plants. So you can really see a difference in what mode of transport you take in which country. And yeah, so I really like to use this tool because then you can see like, okay, which mode of transport is the most, most damaging. Uh, in terms of CO2 impacts, and well, most of the time that's of course going by plane, except of when you go by car alone, and especially if you have a big car. Um, and in the end, it's also very nice because it gives you some stunning uh, facts. Like for example, if I would drive by car alone to Lithuania, uh, I would have a s amount of CO2 emissions that equals. 0.7 square meters of polar ice being melted. I don't know what exactly the methodology oh. is behind that, but it's quite like, oh, wow. bam, straight in your face. Yes. Um, yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. an interesting tool you could use if you want to um, check your own impact of, of your traveling in terms of CO2 emissions. Of course, I realize that, that people still sometimes have to travel by plane. Um, and therefore, I want to give just a small... 
a list of tips that, that you can consider when you travel uh, by plane. One of them is, of course, um, if you consider flying by plane, maybe think about if the destination you're going to uh, is really the destination that is most suiting for you. For example, you can travel to a sunny resort in South America from Europe, or you can go to uh, the south of Europe where it's also sunny. Uh, a second thing you could consider is if you fly, consider staying for a longer time at your destination. Uh, and also, uh, if you fly, then really try not to have any layovers because the more you, uh, the more layovers you have, the more fuel it costs for a plane, of course. Yeah, uh, quite a funny finding is also that if you use more modern airplanes, and you can check that on the website, of course, um, those airplanes most of the time are more fuel efficient, so they are also more clean to fly with. And also, if you fly economy class, actually you fly more sustainably than if you fly business class because more people fit in one plane if everybody flies with the economy class. Yeah, so those are a few uh, technical considerations you can take into account. Um, I also, uh, when you talked about uh, that you can go to this website or that you have certain websites and you can look up how many emissions your uh, specific travel generates, I think that is so interesting that that exists now because what I see in um, travel traveling guidebooks or magazines that they also most of the time now add a little sustainability charts and that they show you how much you um how much a certain trip will cost you in fuel or in water what you said and i think that's such a good development because i can't remember that that has been there in previous years but just recently this is something that goes automatically when you're thinking about a trip that you can also look for this specific kind of information and i think it is really a good development to make people aware of that. Yeah, absolutely. It makes you aware. And uh, it's the same what I just said about the polar ice melting. I, I don't know the methodology behind it, but it makes me really aware of like, oh, woof, that is uh, yeah, quite a yes. shocking fact. Um, therefore, you can also try to adapt your, your trips. Um, because that also brings me to my, my last tip, is um, that you can also compensate your trip uh, via quite many tools. Um, yeah, what is good, what is bad in terms of the tools, the compensation tools you use. That's a, big, a bit of a big question. I know in the Netherlands we have this website milieucentraal.nl and they give very good tips for compensating in the Netherlands. Uh, for Europe or worldwide, I'm not sure. So you have to check that yourself. But that that is one way how you can at least compensate uh, for the damage you do. <laughs> so to pay off your guilt, so to say. Yeah, and the uh, last thing is, if you travel by plane, of course, you go from point A to B immediately. Um, that's also what I found very interesting when I drove to Lithuania for the first time with my girlfriend. Um, that I actually felt connected to the country. Because before I always flew there and I, I went into the airport of Amsterdam, so Schiphol, and then I went out in, in Lithuania and was just, bam, you're there from point A to B. And now I realize that Actually, if I just take my bicycle here in, in, in Wageningen, I could even cycle to Lithuania if I want. I'm connected to the country of my girlfriend, which is really a flabbergasting idea. So, yeah, that's, that's super cool. Um, so, yeah, on this little research, I learned quite a lot from it. I hope it might be useful for you too. Yeah, and a very last thing is uh, that indeed with the plane you go from point A to B, but you can also enjoy... Uh, the journey more than just the destination. And I think Amber has some thoughts on that too, isn't it? Yes, I definitely have thoughts about this because I'm really in favor of door-to-door -door travel. And I don't know exactly if this is an official um, definition, but I think it sounds really cool because it is super important or I think that a lot of people realize more and more that your journey actually starts when you walk out of your front door, when you pack your suitcase and you get in your car or get on a train or get to the airport even. And then it is not only your holiday that starts when you arrive in the country that is your destination. Because then when you, for example, travel to the United States and you have this 
plane flight of 20 hours, you will see it as a hassle and as something negative because it isn't part of your holiday, but it actually is. And that also maybe will help people to decide to take another form of transportation if that is possible. Uh, for example, last year, uh, or li a little bit more than last, than last year, I traveled to Italy by train because I could also fly. But I thought, why not take the train? Because that's also possible because we are connected to Italy and then you travel via Germany. And the thing, how I could decide that is that I really thought it could be fun because it takes a lot longer than plane because I took around 13 hours. And I think by plane is maybe two hours. I'm not exactly sure. But I always also consider that even when you go by plane, you have to check in your suitcase and you have to wait at the airport. And then when you land, you have to wait for your suitcase again. So it is always a longer, longer process than only the flight. But even then, the train is longer. But it was part of the travel and it was so much fun because you go through different countries and we only had one layover in uh, I think in Frankfurt in Germany of an hour so we just hung around there on the train station and a little bit outside of the train station and it's actually really fun because you see so much so I didn't see it as a hassle at all and I was even excited to to start this trip with a 13 hour train ride and I also think that a lot of people think that a train is always uh, more expensive than a, pl a plane flight. And sometimes it is, but really not always. The trick is just to search really well. That's my advice. <laughs> um, because you just have to travel in on weird times, like in the evening or really early in the morning. So we left from Utrecht. I think it was at six in the morning, but that was fine because if you have a flight at 10, you also have to leave very early. So it doesn't even, it isn't even that much difference. So in the end, our train ride was 10 euros cheaper than the plane would have been. So that was awesome. I was so proud. I thought, <laughs> yes, this is so good. And this only makes me more motivated to in the future, if I travel to a country that is possible with another transportation method than flying, I'm super open to investigate it because that's also part of the, yeah, in Dutch we call it voorpret. Like if you prepare for a vacation, you have fun preparing it. And <laughs> you can translate that like foreplay, but <laughs> yeah, I, I wanted to say foreplay, but then I thought, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, okay. that's yeah, I doubt it about that one, <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of the same. So, then if you spend a little bit more time on deciding how you are going to get there, that can also be counted as that. So, it's really not a bad thing to take a little bit more time for that and really look, oh, what is the best way that I can get there? Maybe also have the less emissions what you said that you can really uh, research that on the internet so yeah th that was my trip to italy and, and when we went back it was also also 13 hours but you can just sleep if you want and the trains are very nice so yeah i really want to do that more in the future whenever that's possible yeah and um also when you talked about flying of course i also I flew in the past and I will probably also still fly in the future, but there has also been a lot of times that we did road trips through Europe. We did that a lot as a family um, because we didn't really like flying. Also because of like, a little bit of flight fear. <laughs> <laughs> like We were not super enthusiastic about getting like in the air. Um, and I think a lot of people actually have that. Um, but yeah, we also thought, let's go by car because then we can see even more. Um, and I think that's also a big pro of Europe is that in Europe you can travel actually for so little hours. In, in eight or ten hours you will be in Switzerland and you will be surrounded by mountains. And it's so crazy to think about that, that that we are so close to each other and just in such a short amount of time you can experience this whole different environment and whole different culture and the best way to really grasp that is maybe going by car or by train so that you also 
see everything on the way because if you're on a plane you see the clouds which are beautiful <laughs> but you don't see the countries that you pass and also i think maybe one of my funniest memories have been at gas stations that we had a break in when we went on road trips and that we met a lot of people or that we discussed how dirty the toilets were in this gas station in france or wherever and that's also yeah we wouldn't have that if we would always have flown i think because then you sleep a lot and yeah i just really cherish all those memories that we had next to the highway because we went on road trips actually i found that very interesting last summer when i uh, traveled with my girlfriend to lithuania because that was during the pandemic already and there i could really see the differences in, in terms of uh, measures that countries took per country so when i entered germany like people behave totally differently than in poland so i could really see if i cross the border like uh, okay now i have to wear a mouth cover and keep more distance or less distance people care more or care less i don't know uh, that was really like oh wow like besides the landscape you even see the behavior of people changing which was yeah quite the eye opener for me yeah oh yeah i understand yeah i also um what i also think is when you're in a parking lot in in wherever like france or austria and you see other dutch cars you'll be like oh dutch people <laughs> and you will talk with them and you connect with them but you also talk with maybe other people you meet so it's kind of i don't know it's a it's an activity because you can also think about all these we al always did games in the car, you know, these word games, or you also have car bingo. It's like a game that you have to shout when you see a red car and then the first uh, one that does it wins, stuff like that. And I, I just think that's super fun and that's all part of what makes road trips so, so nice, actually. Yeah, so what I also wanted to ask you mm -hmm. is that... It's about city trips because I really, really love to go into nature. But once in a while, I also really love a city trip because there are so many beautiful cities already in Europe, which are quite close by. And if you travel to a city, how do you move around in a city to, to see it? Do you walk? Do you take a bus? What do you often do? Um, yeah, that varies a bit uh, depending on the group that I'm with. But I think what I like the most is um, in most of the bigger cities you have some kind of uh, bicycle renting system. Uh, for example, Paris. Last year I went to Paris and uh, they had those. This how was it called? Anyway, you could just rent bikes uh, from the street. You could literally use your credit card, bleep, and you got your bike. And exploring a city by bike, I think that is the greatest. Like, I also like to walk, but sometimes, especially in the bigger cities, walk walking takes too long. Um, I don't really like metros that much because, well, what I just explained about Lithuania, that you're just suddenly from point A to point B without seeing what happens in between. Yeah, I think that's why I like bikes the most. Maybe, maybe it's also because I'm Dutch. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> definitely not by car. I did that a few times. But that's horrible because you don't know how the city works, how, how cars uh, drive, but also just the whole vibe of the city. You're always lost by car. So no, definitely not. Um, so even if I travel by car, then I would park my car somewhere in a small town next to the big city and take the train to the city and explore it that way. Um but yeah, definitely my favorite option is my bike, I would say. <laughs> cool. Well, I don't think it is because you're Dutch, because I don't really like exploring by bike in a city. And the only reason for that is because I think it's scary. And I'm Dutch, so I, I can cycle quite well, but not well enough, I think, to explore another city because there are so many people and cars and things to think about. So when I'm on a bike in a city that I don't know, I'm surviving <laughs> instead of sightseeing <laughs> but maybe so that's actually why i like it yeah, like maybe. it's kind of an extreme sport you know <laughs> yeah maybe you're just super adventurous <laughs> yeah i don't know i already have it in in amsterdam for example so in a city within our own country but yeah, okay but yeah. that's amsterdam man, like, yeah right? that's maybe <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's extreme <laughs> yeah i just think it's a little bit scary and i yeah so I never really choose the bike. Um, 
But what I really like, and I know that it's super a touristic thing, and maybe a lot of people don't like it, but the I love... The hop on, hop off bus. Yes. yes. <laughs> I love them. I love them so much. <laughs> just because you can sit on your butt and just look around and enjoy and just, yeah, go off when you want to and come back on when you want to. And I think it's amazing because you can combine walking a lot, but also not walking, so just sitting and being driven around. And I think it's such a, yeah, such a great tool to see everything of a city. And yeah, I know it's it's a super touristic thingy, but yeah, I think it's really, it's really nice. And we did it a lot in a lot of European cities and so many have them. And I, yeah, those are so really wonderful memories I have on the hop on hop, hop on. Blah. <laughs> hop. <laughs> the hop on, hop on. <laughs> yeah, well, the bus that you hop on, hop off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I agree with that. Like uh, <laughs> Most of the time they are a bit expensive, but at the other hand, if you just make proper use of it, uh, like for the full day, or I don't know how um, how exactly the tickets work, but th- then it can be super nice, yeah. Especially because you can indeed hop off, just explore an area, hop on again, and yeah. go to the next area and explore that too. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, and I I also really like walking, even though even if it's super far, um, because that's still that that's also how you maybe come to places that are not that touristic, because that's the maybe the downside of a bus is that they only take you to the places most of the time that they think you would love to see. But if you walk, you can just go anywhere you want. And I remember one time. I went to Rome um, when I was in high school and we walked everything because we had a teacher with us who lived in Italy for a while. So she took us everywhere by walking. So I thought, oh, that's awesome. But I wore this jeans, short jeans pants, which resulted in enormous wounds on my legs because of all the walking. So every evening I had to put on this soft cream (laughs) On my legs <laughs> because you were bleeding. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> so maybe that's not the best story, but it's <laughs> now I can laugh about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those are really good memories. Oh, that sounds very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. What is also maybe an advantage of taking public transportation or transportation within a city or when you travel is that you can experience the differences between public transportation in different countries because you you really see a difference between the Netherlands and 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 many many other countries because here we have uh, this little technical digital screen that says what the next stop is and then this little bell goes and then this great woman says oh you're approaching this stop so it's super clear and then when i lived in finland for six months i um i also went on the bus because i went with some friends to a national park which was just outside of helsinki and those buses didn't have any signs or any announcements of where you were so what we did is we just looked outside and looked at all the bus stops, just hoping that we could read something. And we also looked on our Google Maps where we were. But it was so exciting because we had no idea when we had to get out. So every bus ride was an adventure. And it also resulted in that we made a lot of friends on the bus because there were a lot of other international people who had no idea. And then you talk with each other and say, oh, where do you have to go? Oh, I'm also, I, I also go there. So... It's so funny when I think about it now. It's such such good memories. I, I also... One of my best memories about the bus rides in Helsinki is that at one point we went to the National Park for the second time so we knew where to go. And then there was this girl who was sitting across the bus and she walked up to me and she asked me, um, oh, I need to go here. Do you maybe know where that is? And I said, yeah, we have to go there too. So you can just follow my lead and then you will end up in the right place. And then we started talking and she was from Ukraine. And she was traveling by herself because her boyfriend couldn't get off of work. So she was, okay, bye. (laughs) (laughs) Then I go by myself, (laughs) have fun at work. So I already thought that was awesome. Um, So, and we really connected. And then 
I ask her, if you want to, you can just come with us for the whole day because we go canoeing and then we go on a hike. So if you like, you can just join us. And she did. So we ended up just sharing a canoe together and spending the whole day. And it was so much fun. And I think also the thought that you know, I'm never going to see this person again, most of the time makes it extra special because you can have such a fun day with somebody. And yeah, I will never forget her. And that, that was, I think, purely because there are no signs at buses in Finland. So yeah, I thought that was really great. <laughs> um, so maybe to end this podcast episode, I have a final question for you. And I'm really curious if you know the answer or Bring the answers. <laughs> um, so I looked it up on the internet because we talked a lot about transportation and flying and buses and trains at uh, this episode. I wanted to ask you, what is the best way to sleep on a plane? And I think it also counts for a car or a train. But what is the list? What do people say when you look at academic research? What are the best ways to get asleep on a plane? Laying in the aisle. <laughs> no, I don't even think that's loud. <laughs> Waiting until a little, little trolley hits your head. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> okay, um, but I think it's a creative answer. So, <laughs> Foo, Good question. Do you have experience with laying in the aisle to sleep? Yeah, but then people chase me out already, yeah. <laughs> well, in a bus, I guess, claiming the back seat and then, like, using those five back seats just to lay down. I That's guess a in a plane, one. getting to know the person next to you so you can sleep on her or his shoulder. <laughs> like, That's draw all that. <laughs> it's not in my list, but I think it's it's very good, very good option, yeah. Hmm. No, enlighten me. No, you you know you don't uh, know? maybe with one of those crazy pillows that you put around your neck. I don't know how they are called, but yes, it's part of the list. Well done. Um, so yeah, there's a list that uh, gives tips and tricks to sleep on a plane because there has been a lot of research about it because a lot of people struggle with sleeping on a plane, and it can be a little bit annoying when you have this long flight and then you arrive and then you're super tired and then you have to sleep before you can explore your destination. So, there's a list of things you can do. And I thought that might be interesting for our listeners if they travel. Um, the first one is plan ahead. So, apparently, if you start packing quite early and also already fix your transportation to the airport, your head is more in rest and you have more headspace to fall asleep later because you aren't in a stressful state. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, that's the first one. The second one is meditate. Because meditation really helps to relax the brain. And you have all these med meditation apps where people talk to you in a very soft and gentle voice. Like that. Or better, I can't really do it well. <laughs> I'm um, convinced. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, research showed that that is really helpful. So that's also a tip. And the third one, and I actually really like this one, is lavender oil. Because I know that lavender oil uh, calms you down, but I never thought about it to take it on a plane. But a lot of people um, said that it really works, and there has also been research about it, that if you use 100% oil, it makes you calm and allows you to fall into a deeper sleep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lavender oil, guys, take it with you. Um, so the list goes on. I have a few more. Skip the movies and TV on airplanes. Blue light. Yes, yeah. because the light of a screen will keep you awake. So skip the movies. Bring a book. <laughs> um, bring something comfortable. You had that one. You had the, the pillow. So it can be a pillow or a, a little blanket, just something you feel comfortable in. Cover your eyes is also one. So apparently if your neighbor next to you is sitting on their iPads, even that light can keep you more awake. So if you have this really? little cover on your eyes, it really allows you sooner to fall asleep. Or the lights in the in the hallway, just everything. Every little light can um, uh, energize your brain. So, yeah. So the last two, earplugs. 
So then you don't hear anything the captain says that, that might not be important or other people talking. And the last one, exercise before your flight. Because exercise and sleep are best friends. So if you exercise before you want to sleep, it really allows you to calm down. So if you have a flight in the afternoon, I advise to take a little morning workout and then you can fall peacefully asleep. I'm not chill afterwards. <laughs> that was nice and smelly in the play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's it for this episode. Yos, thank you for having this chat with me. And uh, for our listeners, if you have any suggestions for future topics you would like us to chat about, let us know in the comments below. And yeah, thank you for listening. And we will be back with a new episode soon. Thank you, Amber. <laughs>